Hello, everyone. My name is Sola May Tibabu. I'm the host of Going Digital Behavioral Health Tech. Really pleased to have both Zach and John with us today. Um, before we get started, maybe we could just do some brief introductions. Uh, Zach, how about you first, and then John, please. Sure. I'm I'm Zach Immel. I'm the Chief Science Officer and Co-Founder of uh, Listen IO. And I'm John Campy. I'm the CEO of Bright Heart Health. <laughs> we are a telemedicine behavioral health company. Excellent. Yeah. Let me ask both of you more about what it is exactly you do. Uh, Zach, what does Listen do? And um, tell us more about the AI platform, please. Sure. Yeah. So Listen at its heart is a deeply customizable AI solution for quality improvement in behavioral health care. So we we work with provider groups, training institutions, coaching and wellness organizations to help them scale up the evaluation of the services they're providing, um, kind of give them more insight into the experience their members or patients or clients are having and allow, allow us to use that data to help them make their service better. Um, we also have some tools for doing helping with documentation, uh, training um, as well. And so we we really use the the core AI that we built first at universities um, to help people make make behavioral health better. And just to clarify a little more, if I'm a provider, how exactly could I, in real time, plan to use Listen? Yeah, so we we work with a lot of different types of groups, but just for one example, um, we work with digital behavioral health groups where we can connect with your service and our our AI can run in the background and process all of the conversations that are happening during the course of your workday with your different either coaches, care managers, therapists, docs, and can provide you insight into different evidence-based practices they're using, like motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy. We provide a dashboard where you can use that for supervision to really scale up supervision. But then we also provide ways of assisting with um, documentation, topics, what was discussed during the interaction. And we also provide like a higher level view where um, supervisors and administrators can see what's happening at kind of a global scale inside of their service. And so they can look and see, you know, where do we need to improve and where are we doing really well in terms of how empathic our therapists are being, how much um, cognitive behavioral therapy is being used, where, where are there areas where we could maybe make some interventions to help it being used more, those sorts of things. Excellent. And so you're also partnering with other vendors. Um, let's segue now to um, John. Tell us a little bit more about Bright Heart Health, please, and, and what you do. Yeah, we're a telemedicine behavioral health. We operate in 48 states as a Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial provider. Uh, we treat pretty much the entire spectrum. Uh, we also provide pain management services. So we're a combination of physicians or medical staff, therapists, behavioral health staff, counselors, coaches, peer recovery support, care navigators, case managers. And we focus a lot on access to care. So we provide a 24 hour a day access so patients can get um, can reach us basically wherever they're at. And what were some of the things you were facing, challenges, issues that um, drew you to partnering with Listen? Yeah, kind of an interesting story. I mean, when you're overseeing a company and you're trying to pull all the different levers, you got growth levers you're trying to focus on, which you always think you're in control of, but you're never really in control of. You have expense levers, which are sometimes the easiest levers to pull, right? You can always cut expenses or find ways to try to do things cheaper. Um, but the quality one is always one that's a mystery to people. And as we were focusing on leveraging technology and utilizing you know, more advanced techniques for delivering better quality and touting our quality, meaning that it became a part of our mission, our culture. Everything we wanted to do was stand up the highest quality program possible using the information available to us. One of the areas that we were focused on was motivational interview. And I was just reading peer journals, looking at different things and came across actually one of Zach's articles. And in it was an image that I was presenting to our organization saying, this is the future of us. This is where we're going. Lo and behold, I didn't know after reaching out to Zach saying, hey, I'd like to learn more about this. He's like, well, actually, we do this for our company. And it was great. It turned out to be an opportunity. So what I'm looking for is, yeah, I can you know, always pull the expense side. I'm going to work on and work on the revenue side or the growth side. But it's the quality side where now I have insight into how are my providers doing? What are the things we can do to help improve care? If, we, if patients aren't in care, they're not getting better. 
Meaning if they don't show up and, and they're, they're not there, we can't help them. But when they are there, are we maximizing that opportunity? It's precious time for them. So how do we make sure that we're giving them the best quality care? Amazing. Yeah. You've talked a little bit about um, that. It's been a positive impact for you, but you know, post uh, partnership with listen, what are some of the other results that you saw uh, in working together? Well, I think a couple of the items, which was encouraging that first, when we started working with listen, it was a collaborative relationship. So just the overall, it's not just a technology, you flip the switch and hope you figure it out. Sometimes you get that in the technology world. My background's in technology. So um, that makes it really daunting for an, a behavioral health company to adopt this type of technology. So they were great in supporting us in that way. The second piece was when they actually analyzed all of our encounters, it was interesting. We brought in our clinical director and they started talking about the top people in our organization, meaning being able to utilize MI in session. And the bottom, and what was surprising is, is we could actually think of the provider, meaning they had such insight into the providers. And so that was a first step in like, they understand what's going on and we now need to utilize this. The second piece, we started to look at the data and what we found was and that if we were able to improve our motivational interviewing scores, our retention extended significantly. And again, if we're not keeping our patients in care, assuming that they're not discharging before appropriate, meaning that's what we're trying to prevent against, then we can improve the outcomes. And so that was really an important piece is that we could actually tie it back to quality metrics, revenue metrics, because if you keep patients, you get better revenue, but the quality being the most important. And then we could go back out to our payer sources, Medicaid, Medicare, commercial, the insurance plans and say, hey, look, as we're working with your members, we want to demonstrate to you the quality of our care. And here's how we're doing it. And so that's been a, an open uh, an opener discussion into better contracting, better rates, better all kinds of stuff that go along with that. So it's, it's been a great experience. And so, Zach, I want to turn to you real quick. Um, in addition to Bright Heart Health, you mentioned working with other organization types. Can you give us some examples? Yeah, we, I mean, so we're working with organizations really across the behavioral health landscape. And so, I mean, our, a lot of our initial early customer base coming out of what you were saying, out of the research and training um, institutions, we have a bunch of folks who we work with in training. So at universities all over the country and some even in the UK, um, but really in the last maybe year, we started contracting with kind of large um digital telehealth companies, people like K-Therapy, K-Health. But then we've also started, um, we were really excited. We just announced this, I think maybe last week for um, a large contract with the state of Utah, of really doing one of the first value-based care arrangements that has AI at the center of it, where um, there are, there's legislation that's really around supporting the quality of behavioral health care and publicly funded behavioral health. And then in order to get those, that funding, you have to provide di- um, evidence of quality. And that's a real huge pain point for a lot of these pretty under-resourced, publicly funded places where they're having to find you know, experts to come in and record sessions and evaluate them where that can be more expensive than the session itself. And so we, we can really dramatically um, scale that up. And we have that first contract. We've got another um, couple of them as well. We have a contract with uh, Trent PTS in the UK that's affiliated with um, the NHS Trust. Um, and so, and then a, a variety of other sort of organizations. So it's really been fun to get across the landscape of, of behavioral health and coaching to see all of the the differences, but the commonalities and the pain points people are experiencing. Congrats on all of your success. That's really great to hear. Um, maybe for both of you, if I could ask, we've got a lot of payers, providers, startups, larger telehealth vendors in the audience. What advice would you have for them, um, for folks looking to adopt voice AI digital tools uh, that we're discussing today? Um, Perhaps maybe John, I'll start with you from the you know provider perspective. What's it like being to adopt such a solution? And then um, Zach, to you. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting. Um, it's if you've been in behavioral health for any period of time, the idea of using data to drive your decisions, to drive your care, is is really foreign still, and it's starting to come about that we can take this on, but we're really ill-equipped as organizations to embrace it. We don't have a data scientist team. We don't have an IT team half the time. 
We've outsourced that. And so you sit there and talk about technology, but the implementation becomes problematic in that we don't have the people or the knowledge to do this, just simple things. Uh, so I think that's kind of a big piece that as behavioral health kind of grows and, and adopts this technology, how do you start to transform the organization to think about using data? The second piece is just changing the entire mindset. We want to go into the clinical encounters and we want to think of it being an individualized um, experience and clinical in, um, engagement Yet there is data and predictive engines that tell us what's going to happen, and we can't ignore that. But that's not the way we've been trained. That's not the way we go through education and getting our license. And so I think organizations, when you start to look at, listen, and you start to think about, well, how now do we measure quality? It starts to challenge some of those boundaries. And what we found was that you had to then embrace it all the way up through our culture and our mission. And when you did that, then everyone seemed to gravitate towards it and understand how to use it. But without that, it felt like it was sort of like jamming technology on top of providers who are basically saying, I have enough. EMRs are problematic enough. Electronic prescribing is problematic enough. Why are you doing this to me? Um, so I think that's, to me, been the biggest uh, area that we had to focus on. Zach, any advice for audiences uh, interested in adopting this kind of technology? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I think my my advice is both sort of technical and clinical at some level. And I... I I do have a background as a psychologist and, you know, I have been in a, a director of clinical training and have been a therapist and in, in the VA. And when I, when I was there um, doing full-time clinical work, I definitely sort of like when I was playing baseball in high school, I had the realization that I am definitely not in the top 10% of these folks. <laughs> um, I thought I was fine. Um, I was doing good work. I was helping people, but there were, I was working with these amazing therapists um, who were to me just like, you know, I don't know, emotional athletes, right. Who were doing heroic things every day. And to me, the thing that was kind of frustrating is that they, there was no way for anybody to know, um, who these people were. And I got really curious about like, how do we build tools to support those people? Um, how do we get out of the way, let them do their work and then build an infrastructure that can learn from them and support the work they're doing. And so that, that was really at the heart of the research we started doing, trying to teach an AI to replicate some parts of human judgment for empathy, motivational interviewing, things like that. But the, the trick is that it's, it's not an easy task to use a technology like this to evaluate a very, very human, messy, contextual interaction. Um, even human judgment on those is not perfect. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's certainly not right. If you get two experts looking at the same, go to a psychotherapy conference, right? You show a video of someone doing therapy and all we do is argue with each other about whether or not that person was awful or a genius. And so really you have to use reliable tools that the community has accepted. And then you have to have a team who can build reliable measurement in a way that a machine can actually learn from. And so I guess the thing I would say is there, there really aren't a lot of other groups doing what we're doing and the way we're doing it. Um, and so the things I would ask are, is, is what you're evaluating, is what you're buying really AI? Is it really learning from the data in a way that replicates and attempts to understand um, the human experience of psychotherapy? Is it just picking out keywords? Is it doing really simple things that we could do 25 years ago? Um, and, What's really been exciting about AI in the last decade, really, is the advances in new technology. But the, the pairing of that technology with the clinical expertise, I think, is the thing that's really challenging. And then how you end up partnering with the, the providers who are actually doing the, the work on the ground is um, what's really fun, but also really hard. Thank you. Really good perspectives from both. And Zach, I know there are some folks in the audience who might have some questions or even concerns around AI and biases. How does Listen address all that? Yeah, I mean, often folks, have, the only thing they've heard about AI is that it, it's biased, right? And so it's, it's a very real concern. Um, and I think some of, it's just a, a tremendously complicated issue when you get into the actual real life, even the scientific debate that's happening within the, the literature is that what's really cool about these new technologies is that they can learn from and eventually sort of replicate or pattern match human judgment. 
they aren't perfect, but they get, can get pretty close if you give them good data. But what do we know about human judgment? <laughs> well, you know, huge human judgment can be pretty biased um, in all sorts of ways. Some ways we can know and measure, in some ways it's really hard. And so you have to build that in, right? If, if all we have to evaluate the quality of psychotherapy at some level is a human's expert's judgment on whether or not they've done something well, there's a piece of that that is going to have some bias in it. How do we work with that? And how do we know? Well, first thing you have to do is make sure the data you use to train those models is diverse. It comes from a variety of different providers from all sorts of racial and ethnic backgrounds who are working in all sorts of different settings. They aren't just working in training clinics. They aren't just working in a inpatient unit. They aren't just working in an opioid treatment clinic. They're working in all of those clinics and that you don't just get the data from there. Then you have to invest in labeling that data. And then you have to evaluate how it is that our models are performing across those different types of training sets. And so that's something we've been really focused on, especially a lot of the state contracts that we're working with. It's a part of the contract for them where they want to see that we're tracking these sorts of things and that we're measuring them and that we can report back to them. So that's a piece we're continually working on is both making sure that the data is both diverse and representative of the people we're working with and that we're tracking how our models perform across those. And we've done that in um, sort of academic publications, but are then more moving into doing it at, at the listen side. And I guess I would say one more thing um, related to that is you can just work to try and detect and eliminate bias. It is interesting that one of the things we're working on is you can actually work to build models that can detect potential bias and cultural competence in providers themselves, because um, that is also a product of human judgment. And some things we're working on with um, different experts around the country at universities is building models that can detect how providers are having culturally sensitive conversations. Are they talking about cultural topics during interactions with their clients? How are those conversations going? Those are all things that we can measure um, and should measure at some level. And so I think we're trying to go across those um, different, different sorts of contexts. We're doing things like making sure we train models in both English and Spanish. Um, we have models that can detect Spanglish as well, which is often more common than not, right? People aren't just doing one or the other, they're doing both. Um, we're working with folks in the UK to adapt our language models to detect different accents and things like that. So there's a, a lot of different variations, both sort of culturally, linguistically, um, it's a pretty deep issue. This is so exciting. How interesting. And um, thank you so much for shedding light on that. Um, and this really kind of brings a question of not only are you changing the future, but um, tell us a little bit more about what exactly is on the horizon for Listen. Yeah, well, we're working on lots of stuff. Um, we're, we've got training tools that are getting ready to come out. But I think the, the thing that we're really excited about that's going to come online even in the next couple of weeks is our full um, notes and documentation tool. And so we've been working with folks to build that for about eight or nine months, and it's really looking pretty exciting. And so it's we think it's going to be a really, really big deal to our customers when we've been talking about providers where it's it's not just that we're providing pre-written notes and filling in some keywords. We're fully writing people's notes based on training data from our customers where we have learned how to replicate the kind of data and some of the assessment portion of a note and have started to validate that with current customers. And I think it's going to really be a load off for a lot of providers where, you know, they would rather not, they were doing all that kind of work, but it also, I think is going to be a real engine for helping providers do a lot of other things too. That's got to be the number one thing I hear from providers when I ask them about sure. this kind of tech. When will you be able to handle our notes? And so, John, I know you've been using the notes feature uh, over at Brightheart. Now, how has that changed things for your clinicians? Yeah, it's super exciting. Uh, Zach hit on it. One of the biggest issues you face is burnout and providers, EMRs. As much as they're great for capturing all the data, they're crushing the providers in terms of what they have to adhere to, document, and then have it audited. We staff an entire certified coding team who then comes in and then rejects all these. The providers just you know throw up their hands. And so it really creates a big issue. And we're already in a field where we're strapped for resources. We can't get enough resources. So anything that's causing an issue there. Turnover is a big expense. I talked about the expense side. Um, and then I would also say just satisfaction. You know, am I, am I really focusing on the patient or am I focusing on how do I chart during the encounter? And those are conflicts. 
We don't want those conflicts. That compromises quality. So we started working with it. What's exciting is what Zach brought up is not only are we getting the documentation from the actual encounter, but now we're looking at how we automate the entire process. So we're not just talking about automating how we capture what was said in the in the encounter, but now we can compare it to what diagnoses are on the, the patient's chart. We can see whether or not there was a prescription change. And now all of a sudden we can start identifying CPT codes or billing codes that map to services that were provided that would have been maybe missed by the provider. So all of a sudden you're taking it from the encounter occurs, you're charting the entire encounter, coding it and shipping it off to the clearinghouse and all of that can happen in a day. The efficiency is unbelievable. The workload off the clinicians is unbelievable. It's a game changer in the field. And I'm excited that they went down this path because it's a, for us, when you look at expenses, this is a major area that doesn't generate any revenue other than it is a part of the artifact of the encounter itself. And so the question is, is obviously adhering to regulations and quality issues, but how do we do this in a good way and, and streamline the, the field or the work within the field? So it's exciting. Thank you both so much. This is obviously very game-changing technology. I'm excited for our audience to learn more. Uh, John Campy from Brightheart, uh, Dr. Zach Immel from Listen. Thank you both. Um, where can folks find out more? Maybe John, then Zach? Yeah, certainly our, our website always is. That's the easiest. We try to put a lot out there. Same here, L-Y-S-S-N.io and on social media as well. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for your time.